You don't need a luxury kitchen to prepare gourmet meals. My name is Dennis. I live in a mobile home in a trailer park, and this is my kitchen. Someone who is a fan of my website and my YouTube videos wrote to me, and she said, I'd love to see what you can do with cacovin. That's chicken cooked in red wine. And I thought, yeah, that's perfect because I've been wanting to add more classic recipes to my website. And I've made cacovin before. In fact, I still have my original recipe from my college days. This I soaked off the back of a bottle of cooking wine and then glued it to an index card. This is called Easy Cacovin. And this is really simple and there's not a whole lot here. So what I like to do when I'm doing a classic recipe like this is I like to see what the other cooks, the chefs out there are doing, the good cooks, not me. And I put it all in a spreadsheet. So I have on here recipes from Julia Child, Alton Brown, Ina Garten, Emeril Lagasse, Jamie Oliver, and Tyler Florence. And I put what their ingredients are, the formula that they use, and then I pick and choose what I think I would like to experiment with in my recipe. So that's how I came up with my recipe for Cacovin today. So let's start cooking. I need to cut up some prosciutto and some pancetta here. The original recipe ca called for a bacon that isn't smoked or smoke flavor added. And unfortunately, pretty near all the bacon that I've ever seen in the grocery stores today have that hickory smoke flavor added to them. So when I see a recipe call for bacon, unsmoked bacon, I think of pancetta and prosciutto. I have about two and a half, three ounces each here. You need about two and a half ounces of each. That's about 71 grams. So there's my prosciutto. None of the recipes I saw called for prosciutto, but I liked cooking. I like cooking with prosciutto. And this is the pancetta. Mostly what I want here is the flavoring and the fat. I mean, if you're looking for a low fat recipe, this isn't one that you might not get excited about, or this is one you might not get excited about. Okay, so those are my meats chopped into slivers. I have to start sauteing these now in a saucepan. This gives me an excuse to use my oval pan. In a heavy duty pan, such as a Dutch oven, cast iron, something like that. You want to heat a couple of tablespoons of butter. I have clarified butter, but I'm actually going to use goose fat because I've got it and I want to start using it up. And I do know the French like to cook in goose fat. So melt that. And then put in the pancetta and the prosciutto. And you want to saute this over medium heat until it's lightly browned. A few minutes. So this has been browning now for a few minutes. It's just starting to brown. I turn my heat off. And then I'm going to transfer this to a bowl and set it aside. What I really am interested in here is the fat. I want that fat in the pan. And then once this browned meat cools down, I'll be chopping it up and I'll put some of it in my sauce. I don't know that I'm going to use all of this. As I said, this is not a low-fat meal. I've got plenty of fat in the bottom of this pan. 
Kako vat is typically made with chicken pieces with the bone in. But I have issues. <laughs> when I'm serving chicken to guests, I prefer to get the bones out. I think it just makes it a lot more pleasant to eat at the table when you don't have to deal with bones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to section a whole chicken here. I'm going to leave the skin on, but I'm going to debone the chicken pieces with the exception of one piece. I'm going to leave one drumstick piece with the bone in because when I finish my cooking for the day I take my last photographs of the day what I call my royals and for that I want one traditional piece of chicken with the bone showing so let's start cutting up a whole chicken and what I want to do to start off with is I want to remove the wings and you can either save the wings you can put them in your Kakova. In my case, I'm just going to put them aside and then cook them later on as a snack. I just want the larger pieces in my Kakova. And then let me take the legs off. As I mentioned, I want to keep the skin on because that'll brown nicely when I go to brown the chicken pieces. I've sectioned a lot of chickens in my time and I just know there's certain areas where I want to be very careful. What I'm doing here is I'm cutting down to the joint. There's the joint right there and you can just pop that out and then cut it through the soft part of the joint and there's a piece of meat right down here in the bottom that I want to make sure that I capture because that's a nice nugget of meat why let it go to waste so there's one of the legs off there's a line of fat right here that tells you where the joint is I also feel it with my fingers you can cut right down through that soft part of the joint without having to cut down through any bone. So there's the drumstick. As I mentioned, I'm going to leave one of those with the bone in. But here's a thigh that I'm going to cut the bone out of. When you do enough of these, it's it gets pretty easy. I mean, I've been doing this now for probably 40 years. I just know what to expect. There's a piece of the joint that stays attached here. And there's a boneless chicken thigh with the skin on. Put that on my plate. Do the other side. And now I want to bone this drumstick. So I'm going to cut down, well, first of all, pinch the skin, get underneath it with the knife. There's tendons in there that have to be severed. And then I work with the shortest section and cut down right through to the bone. When I say shortest section, from here to here is rather short compared to down here, which goes all the way around the joint. Okay. Yes, that's a train going by, if you can hear that. I do live near the tracks. As I like to say, this is a trailer park, folks. This is not a fancy house out in the Hamptons. Okay, this, this piece is a little bit more tedious to debone. But I, again, I've done so many of these... There's the bone coming out right there. There's our drumstick bone and a nice piece of boneless drumstick meat with the skin on. Okay, chicken breasts are the easiest. You go right down through the center. There's a bone that sticks up here called the keel. It's attached to the breast bone. 
and then down here is where the wishbone is. So you just separate around the wishbone and then you just follow right down along the rib cage. That's the joint where the wing attached. Cut around that. And then down toward the bottom here, there's an extra piece of meat that I like to save. Okay. And there is a piece of boneless chicken breast. Now, this is to me is a really big serving. I mean, who's going to want to eat all that? So I like to cut this into two pieces. So I get two large servings out of that. This one could even be cut in half. And then the other side. And this, I save all of this for stock. So that's going to go in a, my bowl of trim. Again, cut this in half. And now I've got two servings of breast meat there. So there are all my chicken pieces there. I want to season them with salt and pepper before I start sauteing them. All right, there they are. I'm ready to start sauteing chicken. Returning now back to my pan with the fat in it, I'm going to put the chicken pieces in there. I'm going to have this over medium heat. And I'm going to brown these like a few at a time. I don't want to overcrowd my pan. probably get four pieces in there so I'll do this in two two batches and then I have in the back here a tray that I've lined with metal I mean a metal tray that I've lined with paper towels and when these are nicely browned on both sides I'll transfer them to the paper towels while the chicken is browning I'm going to return back to the prosciutto and the pancetta. This is about half, maybe two-thirds of that meat. I don't want to put all of this in the sauce, but I do want to put some in. And I want to chop this up now so I don't have large chunks. I left it large before because it's a lot easier to lift out of the pan if it's larger pieces. The part that I'm not using, you can set that aside for nibbles. It's great stuff. Okay. Use a bench scraper to move this to my bowl. And now this is going to go into my sauce. My chicken now has all been browned. And I browned these about five minutes per side. I don't know if I mentioned how much chicken total I'm using. It's about five to seven pounds, roughly, really roughly two to three kilograms. So I'm returning my prosciutto and my pancetta back to the pan. I think I can pick these up with my fingers now. They shouldn't be too hot. I'm gonna put my other browned chicken pieces back in the pan, cover this, and I've reduced my heat to low. So I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes. I'm going to cook these over low heat for 10 minutes. Okay, so I've cooked these now for another 10 minutes in low heat. I just raised my heat back up again. And five minutes through, I turned everything over. So now what I want to do is pour my brandy. This is 
quarter cup of cognac or brandy. And then I'm going to ignite that. Shake the pan back and forth. <laughs> Let me look through my lens. No, I didn't melt my camera. Made a mess of my stove though. So that was a quarter cup of brandy. And next I want to add, this is a 750 milliliter bottle of burgundy. And I'm going to add about half the bottle. Quite a bit more. A little bit more. Okay, so there's my burgundy in there. And then one and a half cups to two cups of homemade chicken stock. You want to just bring this up till you cover the meat. So I'm going to put a full two cups in there. I'm going to bring this back up to a boil. Okay, my liquid now is coming up to a simmer. I'm going to put about a tablespoon or so of tomato paste in there. A couple of bay leaves. This is some minced garlic. Three cloves. And this is about four to six sprigs of fresh thyme. And then what I need to do is just kind of stir that tomato paste around a little bit. That'll blend in as the liquid simmers. I want to cover this and then I'm going to simmer this now over low heat. Reduce my heat down to low and simmer this for 25 to 30 minutes. A couple of things worth mentioning. You saw me put two cups of stock in the pan. That was homemade chicken stock. That's why I like to work with whole chickens because I save the trim for making stock. I always have a lot of chicken stock in my freezer. But if you want to, you can use the chicken broth that's available in the store. I would try to find something that's low sodium so you don't end up with too much salt. Two, one and a half to two cups is about 350 to 475 roughly milliliters of stock. I have about 30 pearl onions here. This is about four ounces or 113 grams. You can buy them canned, already peeled, or you can buy them fresh and peel them yourselves. They're kind of tedious to peel. The easiest way is to just drop them into boiling water for two or three minutes, then cut one end off and then just give them a squeeze and pop the insides out. I actually peeled these by hand when I was, while I was watching TV because I just simply didn't care. So there's my pearl onions. I also need to cut up my mushrooms. These are little creminis. I shouldn't say little. They're about medium size creminis. I was looking for the smaller ones, in which case I would have just quartered them. But these are a little bit larger, so I'm going to cut each of these into six pieces. I would use just the standard cremini or white button mushrooms. You could, I suppose, if you wanted to, use shiitakes or one of the more fancy mushrooms. But for this, I think just the little white button mushrooms are fine. So there are the last of my mushrooms here. What I have here for total weight is just under half a pound, maybe 200 grams total. I've turned my heat off under my chicken here. I wanted to remove that lid carefully so I don't fog up my camera lens. Actually it has a filter protecting the lens but it can still fog up. So what I'm doing now is I'm transferring my chicken pieces to a bowl on the side here because what I need to do 
is concentrate this liquid. So now I've brought up the heat to medium high and I want to boil this fairly rapidly now until I reduce that liquid to less than half of its volume. So there's my liquid nicely reduced now. Let me see if I can get my two bay leaves out of there. And then there's my, I'm going to risk my fingers. There we go. That's why I put tied it with a string. So it would be easy to remove from the liquid. All right, there's my nicely reduced liquid. I want to get my tasting spoon and then taste that for salt. This is my infamous red handle tasting spoon. If you're not familiar with it, it goes in my mouth, not in the pot. That is actually quite good. It might use a little bit of salt, but I think I'm going to leave that. No salt. Now what I want to make here, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, is a beurre-manier, which is two tablespoons of butter and three tablespoons of all-purpose flour. And I want to blend these together. The butter is at room temperature, so it's soft. And I want to bun, blend that to form a paste. Get it smooth. All right. Now I want to stir this into my liquid. I've let the liquid cool down a little bit. It's not boiling right now. Otherwise it might get lumpy when I add this. But I'm going to use this to thicken my liquid. I want to use this beurre manier to thicken my liquid here. I'm going to stir that in as best I can while the liquid is cooled. Now I'll bring up my heat to medium high. And I also have here that I never use. I have a plastic whisk for whisking liquids in coated pans. A metal whisk would scratch that coating. And you need to bring this up to the boil in order for it to thicken. Okay, I'm satisfied that that's blended well enough. Now I can go back to my spatula. Because what I'm looking for is I want to see how it coats the spatula. Alright, so this has now come up to a boil. I'm going to turn my heat back off. And you can see that that's got a nice thickness to it. So that's nicely thickened. All right, now I want to put my chicken back in my pan. If you can hear loud music in the background, I apologize for that. That's the imbeciles across the street. So you just want to arrange your pieces in there nicely. You can see how much that liquid has gone down now when you look at it this way. I put enough liquid in there before to, to cover the chicken. And now I want to sprinkle the pearl onions in there and the mushrooms. All right, 
Then I'm going to put a lid on that. And I'm going to bring this up to a simmer and let it cook for just like a minute or two. Caco vin in its most traditional form is usually served as the chicken with the sauce and the mushrooms and the onions. If you look in the, on the internet, look at different recipes, you'll see some variations. For example, I've seen some that use, that will add celery, chopped celery and chopped carrots. That seems more like an Americanized version. I like that. I did that with my chicken fricassee. I added chopped vegetables. What I like to do with caco vin is I like to serve it over a bed of buttered noodles. So that's what I'm going to do. And I made some pasta dough so I could make my own noodles, but you could buy the noodles, the egg noodles that they sell in the store. So I'm going to make a more rustic noodle here. And I'm going to start off by cutting this in half and I'll work with this in two pieces. I'm not going to use any cutter on my machine, so I took my attachment off and I'm going to cut it with a knife. So I just want to roll this through, starting at the widest setting. And then I just want to cut this into some wide noodles without being too fussy about keeping all of the pieces the same width. So it's a little on the rustic side. Right? You get the idea there. So now how I would plate this. Put some of my noodles on my plate. Uh, let's just put them all on there. Oh, beautiful homemade noodles. And then bring my caco vin over. And spoon some of the mushrooms. And the onions over it. Put a nice big piece of chicken on there. Maybe two. Get plenty of that wine sauce onto the noodles. Oh, doesn't that look fantastic? Maybe garnish that with a little bit of chopped fresh pars parsley if you wanted to. So there it is, caco vin. The last step is to see how good that tastes. <laughs> I haven't had caco vin in years. I made this when I was in college, but I haven't made it for myself in a long time. Mm. Very tender. I didn't add any salt to that. I want to taste the onions and the mushrooms. If I can get one here. There we go. Mm. <laughs> Cooked to perfection. So excuse me. I gotta go enjoy my caco vin. For a printable PDF copy of this recipe with step-by-step -step photographs, visit the White Trash Cooking website and look on the home page or in the recipe archive.